Mm-hmm. Cool. So yeah, today we're going to talk about um we'll start with categories, right? So categories. So essentially we're going to going um in onto a higher level of abstraction. Um to like uh start from a different kind of foundation than that of set theory, right? Set theory in set theory we had elements uh, and sets containing elements um, but in category theory uh, we are going to have objects and we're going to have relations between those objects and um, those objects and those relations together will form a category and then we'll have relations between uh, categories right um, so th that's uh, kind of the level of abstraction as it goes uh, so you have objects you have relations between them, and then you have categories and relations between categories. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll start with uh, the definition of what um, a category is. So, a category um, has a class of objects uh, which are in the category. And uh, for any two objects, you have a set that uh, essentially comp comprises of all the uh, functions that you can have between the two objects, right? So these two objects, A and B, um, have all the morphisms between them in the set, um, this form of A, B, under the category C. So um, the, the, the crucial thing to uh, note is that the objects themselves don't necessarily um, matter that much as much as the morphisms between them matter. I mean, okay, so the thing is, uh, the basic um, place you start from is the category of sets, where the objects are sets. And then you have functions between sets, those are the morphisms. Uh, but um, the functions and the morphisms are going to like tell you something about those objects and how they relate to each other. Um, but again, uh, your categories can be different, they can be smooth manifolds, they can be groups, um, topological spaces, um, different kinds of things, right? But for something to be a category, we need uh, some axioms to be satisfied, right? And um, these are essentially the axioms that we would need to have. <coughs> So, um, okay, so if you have a category C, then for every object A, uh, there must exist at least one morphism um, that is written as one sub A, which is included in the uh, home set of A with itself, and that is the identity on A, right? So, um, for every object, you can um, have at least one morphism to itself, um, and we have that as the identity, right? Um, then uh, the second axiom is about composing morphisms, just like we saw before composing functions. Uh, you can compose morphisms. So if you have two morphisms, uh, say F, which goes from A to B, and G, which goes from B to C, then we can have a uh, morphism GF, which goes from A to C, right? So, um, this is how you compose morphisms, just like we did in um, functions. Um, so if you like, if you now have three uh, objects of the category, now you can uh, pair these um, morphisms, right? Like uh, by taking the Cartesian product and then defining a function which takes this pair and you know uh, gives the composition to them. So. Uh, here you have the home set A B cross home set B C, so you're taking morphisms from A to B and other uh, morphism from B to C, and then you're giving uh, getting a morphism from A to C. That's the composition, right? So um, yeah, the law of composition on morphisms lets you have that. Now again, as we saw in functions, this composition law is associated to so um, if you have like um, F, G, and H, uh, three morphisms from A to B, B to C, and C to D, uh, then you can like essentially uh, place the parentheses as you want, 
between um, each of these morphisms under the uh, composition law right so uh, whether you have the morph sorry parentheses over hg or gf um, it doesn't really matter uh, because uh, the law is associated now the last um, axiom um, that needs to be satisfied is that the identity morphisms are identities with respect to the composition right so um, that is for all the morphisms f from a to b we have um, f composition 1a gives you f and 1b composition f gives you f right so essentially the thing is uh, the way you like compose the morphisms uh, like that is dependent upon how you would have the identity right so if you change how you like compose the morphisms you're going to have different identities right so um that's uh like the definition and how uh, what a category looks like right so yeah so uh, we ha also have another requ uh, requirement uh is that if you have uh these two home sets uh from a to b and c to d um they have to be disjoined um, unless um, A is C and B is D because the thing is um, home set from A to B represents all the morphisms from A to B right and uh, they cannot be they, like this set cannot have anything in common with this set because you know they are morphisms like from and to different locations right so um, they have to be disjoint by definition So yeah, so like we saw this before, but like if you have a home set um, like for an object to itself, then um, it's an endomorphism. So a morphism of an object A to itself is an endomorphism. And endomorphisms are actually very um, special and important. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll meet enough of those uh, later in our course, but... Uh, but yeah, normally you meet them in linear algebra, most probably. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's uh, that was um, category definition, and then we um, try to like instead of like writing all these axioms, uh, we can like uh, do something better, which is uh, creating diagrams for this uh, these objects and these morphisms and. That's uh, one of the great uh, things about category theory that you can you can pretty much like you don't really have to write anything which you can draw a diagram of. Right? So um, instead of writing like F is an element of home um, A B with respect to the category C, you can just have uh, like A B and draw an arrow which uh, represents the morphism F from A to B. Right? So um, these diagrams of morphisms in any category, um, like they um, are said to be commuting, right? So they, these diagrams commute if you can, you know, if these morphisms um, actually satisfy the law of composition, right? And um, we've seen this before in functions, but uh, we'll get more into that as we like do the diagrams. Okay. So yeah, we have a few examples on uh, what a category looks like. So um, so the thing is, uh, for like um, writing categories, uh, normally you just have a different kind of font for uh, the name of the category to like um, distinguish it from uh, like just. Um, any other uh, word. So here, this represents the category of sets, right? And here, uh, the objects are the sets, and the morphisms are um, the uh, functions from uh, between these sets, right? Okay. So here we have another example of which is different, where you have a set. And uh, you have um, actually um, 
an equivalence relation on it, uh, that is tilde. Right, so, and it satisfies the flex of untransitive properties. So, um, you can try and, like, um, have this in terms of a uh, category. Um, so here the categories are, uh, in the, in this category, the objects are the elements of S and the morphisms, um, are defined in, in this manner, right? So if we have two objects, um, from this, um, S, um, then um, HOM AB uh, is the set consisting um, of the element um, AB, that is, you know, it's an ordered pair, um, if A is um, identified with B using this relation, right? So if you can, um, what it's saying is that, like, you can make an ordered pair if uh, these two elements in the ordered pair satisfy the relation that we're trying to define uh, for the category, right? Uh, otherwise, if none of these objects satisfy this, then you just have the null set, right? So, um, AB is the null set if uh, none of that, um, none of the objects are um, can be identified with each other, right? Yeah, and uh, like as you can see here, the morphisms are going to be uh, like very um, few, right? Because we have put in restrictions to what can be um, a morphism here. So um, we have to, again, we have to see, to prove that this is actually a category, we have to uh, verify the conditions that we listed before, right? So we have to see that if these uh, objects do have identities or not, right? So if um, A is an object, that is A is an element of S, um, then uh, you need to find an element 1A, uh, which is actually um, an endomorphism, right, of A. And um, th this works because we have assumed that this relation that we had is uh, actually reflexive, right? So if... Um, uh, if you remember when we defined the equivalence relation, the equivalence relation being reflexive means that if you uh, put the relation to the element itself, um, it always satisfies, right? So for all A, um, A is always identified with A using the relation. So um, the identity uh, actually exists. So the home set of A with itself, that is the set of endomorphisms, Consists of the single element A A, right? Because uh, you know, uh, for all A, you will have uh, the ordered pairs with the same element. So, and that would consist of the uh, identity for this uh, object, right? So, um, we satisfied the uh, condition for identities. Uh, now, for composition, you're going to take three objects, um, the elements of S. They, then you would like um, have two morphisms between um, these objects. So F goes from A to B, G goes from B to C, and then you um, you know compose them according to composition. Um, the GF now goes from A to C, right? So, um, mm hmm Okay. So yeah, now um, F is a morphism from A to B. So it's, a, it's an element of this home set. So now, yeah, that means that the home set is non-empty, right? Yeah. And um, by definition of what we defined as the morphisms in this category, if you remember, we just defined it here, right? Uh, which is these order pairs. Um, means that um, a uh, is equivalent or identified to B, um, and F is in fact the element AB of uh, A cross B, because F is an element of this home set, so F must be uh, the element AB, it's, it has to be an ordered pair, right? Uh, the same way, uh, G is an element of this home set, uh, which means uh, G must also be the ordered pair BC, Right, because we're considering the home set B C. Um, now, if A is um, equivalent to B and B is equivalent to C, then that implies we can have A 
um, equivalent to C because we know that the equivalence relation that we have is transitive, right? So um, you can um, have this implication. So what that t tells us, that tells us that this, um, if we can have A identified to C, so that means uh, this thing is going to be an element in home set AC. Um, and that is going to be, uh, by definition, GF, because GF is in this home set, right? So um, that, um, you know, that shows the, that the composition on these morphisms is well defined. Um, now the last, uh, not really the last, but yeah, we have to check that um, this uh, operation, this morph, the law of composition is actually associated. So you take three morphisms, um, A, B, B, C, C, D, um, then um, necessarily as we saw before, F is going to be the order pair A, B, G will be B, C, and H would be C, D. These are order pairs. Uh, and as we defined, uh, as we saw, uh, GF, the composition will be AC, and HG will be BD, right? So now, now you just like repeat the process of composition. You, um, you know, add in the third component, and uh, you put in the parentheses. So, right, so H of um, H composition GF is going to be. Uh, what is it going to be like? So CD composition AC is going to be um, AD, right? Uh, similarly, HG composition F is going to be um, like uh, BD composition F. Um, F is just AB, so BD composition AB uh, is again going to be AB, right? So uh, that shows how. Uh, this law of composition is actually associated and the last one is actually an exercise um, about the um, about how the identity is actually unique to the composition and this is also not really that difficult to see hmm. Okay, so the most trivial instance of this construction is the category obtained from a set S with the equivalence relation um, of just sign equals G, right? So that is the only morphisms are the identity morphisms, yeah, right? So um, right here we had like A tilde C, like you had some kind of relation, but when you have the equals to symbol, you're like exactly having the identity of morphisms. Right? And these categories will be uh, called discrete. Okay, so yeah, we'll see a few more examples, um, and then um, we'll see how diagrams work according to what uh, we've seen about uh, the categories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, here's another example. So um, you have set S uh, again, and then you define a category um, S hat uh, by setting um, the objects of this category to be the power set of the set S, right? Um, so that's interesting. So all the objects of the um, category are the power set of the uh, set S, right? So uh, for uh, if you have to, if you take two objects A and B of uh, this category, um, then they would be the subsets of um, S, right? And then if you take uh, the morphisms between these two objects, uh, then these morphisms are actually pairs A B. Um, if um, A happens to be the subset of B, right? So uh, you define that to be the uh, way you uh, have morphisms between um, these two objects. Um, and if, if that doesn't satisfy, if there is no A, 
which is a subset of B, then uh, this home set is going to be the null set. We don't have any morphisms. Then again, uh, like before, you consider the identity um, on each of the objects. So uh, one A is going to be the pair A with itself. Uh, so it's going to be the only morphism in the home set, right? Because uh, A indeed is a subset of itself. Um, so uh, and then uh, what you do is uh, like if you have um, more and more morphisms, you like uh, have the composition. So you will have like um, a chain of uh, subsets, and um, you can check the axioms that like they actually are valid. So, um, yeah, so, um, th this is kind of like an interesting, uh, category if you think about it. Um, we have seen some of this, uh, before, at least I have seen in topology, when you're doing, uh, like compact spaces, covering spaces, you tend to, you try to, like, form these chain of subsets, one including the other. And um, like um, that that's kind of important, yeah hmm. so yeah, so now we're trying to um make diagrams of these um categories, right so um. We have a category again, and um, we have the we have one object A of this category. Now you're going to define um, category C A, whose objects are certain uh, morphisms in C. Um, yeah, so whose objects are morphisms in C, right? You're taking the morphisms as objects, uh, and whose morphisms are certain diagrams of C, right? So this uh, category is made up of objects which are morphisms so you have uh, functions um, of which are uh, like morphisms and they are the objects uh, and the morphisms of the category are the diagrams of um, C right so th this CA is the category which we're talking about and the CA is uh, kind of induced from this category C, right? So here uh, the class object um, of the category C A is all morphisms from any object of C to A, right? Um, thus, an object of C A is uh, a morphism F, um, yeah, F, which is a morphism from Z to A for some Z of um, the category C. Right, so um, these are your objects of the category C A, and um, you can uh, like pictorially represent this um, in this manner. You have Z um, and an arrow to A, and that arrow is represented with F. Right, so that those are the objects of the category. Now we consider uh, what the morphisms of this category are. And, um, and yeah, th and they say that there is actually only one sensible way to assign morphisms, uh, which has objects of this kind. And, um, if you want to think about this, uh, like, l let's try to think about this before we move on, actually. Um, Again, what would what would be the objects of this category like? These objects are going to be look like this. So you have Z to A, then you might have like Y to A. It would be G, uh, the morphism. Then you might have like X to A, with the morphism H. So these three are objects of um, the um, category. Now, how do you have relations between these objects? Like you make morphisms between them, right? So if we have like x to a uh, using the um, morphism g, then um, how you like make a relation between x uh, and z is by you know having a morphism like um, you know between these two. 
and um, that is what a diagram is going to look like right so here uh, we do exactly that so you have z1 so instead of x they they take z1 and you have z2 and you have both of them co coming to one using different uh, morphisms f1 and f2 right and the objects are these morphisms f1 and f2 right uh, of this category so now what you do is you try to have um, a morphism between these two right and how you do that is by having something called this like this you have the sigma which goes from z1 to z2 right so it connects these two morphisms and it gives you a commutative diagram right so these commutative diagrams are actually the morphisms of um, the category C A, right? So it, it, it's kind of like confusing because you know we're it's kind of like a uh, word salad at this point. But yeah, you, how to not get confused is that you have to remember these are the objects, and uh, you're trying to find a relationship between these two objects, and this relationship is going to be the morphism of the category, right? And that is what it is. Right? Okay. And um then um like we define the objects and the morphisms, then um it's a matter of checking whether they are actually um are consistent with the axioms that we um defined before, right? So um, the identity uh, is straightforward, right? So the identity is just going to be like, uh, instead of having two different morphisms, you're going to have the same morphism F and F, and you're going to have like one Z as the um, uh, identity morphism from Z to Z. And this whole thing is going to give you one F, uh, which is going to be the identity for uh, the morphism F in the category C A. So, so yeah, it's pretty clear because you have two different categories C and C A, and uh, this uh, is what we're talking about C A, right? And this part from Z to Z is actually from the category C. Right? Okay. Then you have to um, like um, form a way of like composing these morphisms. Um, so how you do that is by like having you know three uh, three Z's. So you have Z1, Z2, Z3. Z1 goes to A with F1. Z2 goes to A with F2. Z3 goes to A with F3. And uh, you have uh, these morphisms sigma and tau. Which goes from Z1 to Z2 and Z2 to Z3, right? So this whole thing is a commutative diagram. Um, and, um, you can, uh, actually, uh, to, to show that this actually, um, satisfies composition is you can remove this middle thing. You can remove this whole object. So this whole thing is an object, right? You can remove this whole object. You can compose these two morphisms, tau and sigma. And your whole thing stays commutative, right? So your whole diagram now becomes like this. You have the morphism tau sigma going from z1 to z3 directly, and you have the two objects f1 and f2, right? And that commutes. And um, that shows that uh, the composition is uh, defined, well defined in this category. And uh, these kind of categories uh, where you have like um, like a single um, um, object where you have like a single object to which you have morphisms from several objects. So Z1, Z2, Z3 all map to A. Um, and these uh, categories are kind of called as the slice categories. Um, we might meet some of them later.
So yeah, so they um, give a few more examples. Uh, we're not going to go through all of the examples. That will be um, quite hard for us to cover. Um, but we'll go through some of them. Anything anyone wants to ask, um, I'll get some water. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, see, um, what was that? The, these few examples, why? So after the slice categories, you have uh, something called the co-slice categories. Um, so... You have something similar, right? Um, but instead of, um, let's see. Mm-hmm. By considering morphisms in a category C from a fixed object to all objects in C, right? So, right, instead of, um, in the previous example, we fixed A and we took several more, several objects um, like we took several morphisms from several objects to A. So A was fixed. Your endpoint was fixed, roughly speaking. But uh, in this case, what you're fixing is like the starting point, right? So you have A as the fixed object, and then you have um, all other objects are uh, in C, and you're going to have morphisms from A to all those objects, um, and then you know. You know, you're going to form a category as we did, have commutative diagrams, and this would lead to something called the coastalized categories. And um, the details of the construction are on exercise uh, in the uh, following section. Yeah, I, I think you can obtain the coastalized categories um, categories by just flipping the arrows on the slice category. Just flip all the arrows or certain arrows, and and, yeah. and that's how you construct it. Indeed, it's it's pretty much the same thing. You can just flip the whole thing, uh, like um, you know, upside down, and it will be um, it it will be consistent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um what else? Let's see. So okay, so let's uh see a concrete instance of uh this category, I think the coast last category, right? Um so you have C as the set, category of sets, and uh A is a fixed singleton. Right, so A is a fixed singleton, okay. Now, um, call the resulting category set star. Okay, so that's the new category that we get in some way induced from the um, original category C. So, an object in set star is a morphism, yeah, it is a morphism, which takes, uh, which goes from uh, the singleton um, to S, right? And S is any set um, in the category of sets, right? These are are the objects. So these morphisms are the objects in set star. Now, um, mm -hmm. The information of an object in set star consists therefore of the choice of a non-empty set S 
and of an element uh, lowercase s um, in the set. Yeah, right. So, right. So the objects um, of the category are going to be um, the f or the image of the singleton, right? Um, so uh, this, uh, these objects uh, would be th these images of the singleton that would be uh, this small s, um, and you have a pair with the capital S the set. So. Right, so what you have is like for first you have the morphism f from the singleton star to a set s, then you have the image of that singleton which is small s. Now this big s and the small s together make a pair that is an object of this category, um, and you can have uh, again a morphism between these objects. Right, so this will be. Uh, like this, s comma s to t comma t. Right. Um, again, you you can like try to check this um, whether they are whether they satisfy the axioms or not. Um, kind of straightforward. The identity is straightforward, um, but yeah. Okay, so the objects of set star are called pointed sets. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're called pointed sets because uh, you know the objects are sets with a specific point, uh, which uh, kind of represent this object, right? <clears throat> Okay, so we have a few more um, examples, right? And then uh, we will be done with this section. Okay, so um, now we start uh, from a given category C, um, and you take two objects from C. Um, now you define a new category um, for these two objects. And uh, that is C A B. Um, so you do define it the same way we define for C A. Actually, um, you, the objects of C A B are these diagrams. Um, all right. That is um, from um, F, wait from Z. You have the morphisms F and G to A and B. Right. Yep. You have um, one fixed object uh, from the. We have you have one, one fixed object, and uh, you have the other two from C. Okay. Uh, so these are the objects. These diagrams are the objects, and then the morphisms would be again um, morphisms between these two objects. So you have Z1, Z2, F1, G1, um, and F2, G2. And you have these um, morphism, and um, like for this, you can represent a nice commutative diagram, which is this, um, and it looks very nice, <laughs> at least to me. Um, you have um, a nice representation for what this category, uh, like how the objects in this category are related. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some more interesting examples, let's see. Um Start with a given category C, and this time choose two fixed morphisms. 
um, two fixed morphisms alpha and beta. So alpha goes from A to C and beta goes from B to C uh, and these two are morphisms in the category C. Okay. And they have the same target C. Yep. Um, now what you do is you can consider um, a category uh, from these two morphisms. Um, so that will be C alpha beta um, category from these two morphisms and um, this category has objects as the commutative diagrams. So these commutative diagrams are the objects of this category and um, they are like this which is that okay let's see we have a and b going to c alpha beta and then you have z which uh, goes to a and b through f and g right so just as we had before right and this whole thing is an object um of c alpha beta okay and the morphisms again will be uh, between objects of this kind so you're going to have um, a and b as we had before going to c with alpha and beta but we're going to have a different is now we're going to have two different things z1 and z2 um, z2 goes to a with f2 z2 goes to b with g2 uh, z1 uh, with f1 z1 with g1 right and between Z1 and Z2, you have the morphism sigma, as it always has. Then, like, the goal, I believe, is to... Okay, so the goal is uh, trying to think how you're going to have identities and, um, like, composition um and how it will work uh in this uh, specific category and um i would say it's it's worth spending uh, a few minutes on this let's see okay so the, the objects uh, of this uh category are clear and so are the morphisms uh you just like have to think like how the composition is going to work so let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this, this, uh, like, um, the author kind of, like, uh, puts this as a test to see if you can, like, deal with this kind of abstraction at this level. And, um, let's see. The identity for um, each object. So the identity for each object is like the identity of the commutative diagram. And um, mm -hmm. Anything anyone would like, like anyone has an idea like what this would look like. The identity or the, um, the composition.
I mean, I, I can picture composition, I think, but I, I can't think of what the identity would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so let's, yeah, how the composition do you think will work? Um, sort of like that. <laughs> yeah, that was a picture I had in my mind. Okay. Um, just some other object and um, some um, other functions. And the, the key is the sigma, right? So the, the one that relates both. Yeah, right. So I think this is, like, if you try to do this the way we did for the slice category, you put in another z3. Um, so you have z2 to z3, that is tau. Um, so now, okay, I'm kind of drawing this on my pay, uh, on my notebook. So z3 goes to a with f3. Um, but these morphisms uh, alpha and beta are always fixed, right? Um, Z3 goes to B with G3. Um, now you do the same for Z2. Z2, yeah, Z2 was F2 and G2. And Z1 was um, F1 and G1 again. <coughs> and your goal is to show that um, you can essentially remove the entire Z2 thing. So you can remove F2, you can remove G2, and things will still be commutative um, by taking the composition of uh, sigma and tau, right? Yeah. Yeah, and if you can show that, uh, and it's pretty straightforward to show that, um, then it works. And for the identity... Um, the identity would be just, um, I think, set to set and the like the identity on on set. Yeah. So instead of in the picture that was below, instead of set one and set two, just both Z. being set and sigma being yeah 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 okay. um, the identity in the original category. So it will be just one sub z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that was fun. <laughs> Um, you have a few problems in this section, you might want to try some of these. Some of these are in the PSAT already, so, yeah. I haven't even checked it in a long time, let me see if I put any other problems from any other books. I don't think I did. No, it's, it's all from Alufi. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, like, is everyone like familiar or like, um, like has done things with LaTeX? Um, I mean, you can submit your solutions even handwritten, but uh, LaTeX is kind of uh, preferable if if you can. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do it again. That's good, yeah. Okay, so we have a few um, special things about morphisms. And yeah, let's see. Right, so yeah, we've seen different kinds of functions. Uh, we've seen uh, injective, uh, subjective, bijective functions. Um, but yeah, we have some categories of um, these morphisms as well. Right. So first uh, is the isomorphisms. Okay, a morphism uh, from A to B is going to be an isomorphism if it has a two-sided inverse under composition, right? So what that means is that you have uh, some other morphism in the opposite direction from B to A, such that when you compose it with um, the original morphism F, 
you always get the identity right on, on the um like on the set um a or on the set b depending upon how you're taking the um composition yeah so um mhm mm um yeah so like in bijectivity we sh we saw that like um like by definition of a bijective uh, function uh its inverse has to be unique right but um the thing is uh this is not uh so uh, with the case of isomorphism by definition it is um not unique you kind of have to um work a bit to prove that it is uh unique the inverse of an isomorphism and it's pretty easy to prove right? um so you just uh act with contradiction you just go with contradiction you assume that you have two inverses g1 and g2 um then um you have to show that g1 and g2 are essentially equal um so you you what you do is you just like compose f uh with g1 and g2 uh, on both the sides you get the identities respectively because they are both the identities right that's what we assumed and uh you get this which is um yeah so you can write g1 as g1 composition 1b 1b is the identity on b so 1b can be written as fg2 because g2 is the identity, right? Um, now uh, and as the composition is associative, so you can like move the parentheses, uh, and you will have this 1a composition g2, and that will be g2. So g1 is equal to g2. Thus, um, for every isomorphism, its inverse is actually unique. Hmm. Okay, so now we have a proposition. Um, uh, we have a proposition, and we have to uh, prove uh, the proposition is kind of like straightforward. So um, each identity is an isomorphism, um, and it is itself its own inverse. Right, that's straightforward. Um, then, if f is an isomorphism, then f inverse is an isomorphism to yeah. And further, uh, if you take the inverse of the inverse, you're going to get the uh, isomorphism back. Okay, so now if you have two um, isomorphisms f and g from a to b and b to c, then the composition uh, of those two is going to be also an isomorphism and its inverse is going to be the composition of the inverses of these two f and g right mm -hmm. okay And the proof is like, um, I mean, these statements actually prove themselves. Uh, uh, you can <laughs> verify each of them, but um, it's, it's the same as we did here. You just apply the definition of the composition and um, um, they satisfy. Indeed. So yeah, you have to. Um, this is something to note that when you're taking the inverse of a composition, your order of the composition uh, gets reversed. So a GF uh, inverse is equal to F inverse composition G inverse. All right. Yep. Example of these isomorphisms. Uh, is that in sets uh, there are the bijective maps, the bijections, right? And yeah, we almost forgot this. That if two categories have an isomorphism between them, then they're isomorphic, and you write them in this manner. A. Um, this is also the symbol for congruence, but here is um, 
um, the symbol for isomorphism. So A is isomorphic to B. This is how you read it. And as we go uh, ahead in our course, we're going to like use this concept of isomorphism a lot. And um, it's, it's, it's good to have this kind of intuition that the isomorphism, what it does, it lets you have a kind of uh, relation between two things which makes them similar. So, so it's kind of like um, having an equivalence between two objects. Um, and we're going to see this when we see isomorphism between groups. Um, and uh, we're going to see um, vector spaces and stuff. Um, there you'll see that isomorphism is uh, a way of telling how things can be equal, equivalent. And if you have done topology, in topology the isomorphisms are homeomorphisms, right? So th they are like topologically the same thing if you have an, uh, if you have a homeomorphism. But yeah. Okay, so let's see. Um, so there are categories in which every morphism is an isomorphism, all right? And uh, they are um, um, called groupoids. All right? So groupoids are kind of uh, they are not groups. Um, the category of groups is a separate thing, but uh, groupoids are uh, a more uh, loose version of groups. They don't have as many restrictions as group has. Um, okay. Okay, so then an, an automorphism of an object um, is an isomorphism from A to itself, right? So it's it's kind of like the special case for endomorphism. Remember, the endomorphism is just a morphism from A to itself, but an automorphism is the endomorphism, which is uh, an, an isomorphism, right? Um, so the set of automorphisms A is denoted by um, this uh, notation, and it is a subset of the endomorphisms on A. And we're going to use uh, these notations extensively when we deal with uh, groups. So by Proposition 4.3, composition confers on the set of automorphisms a remarkable structure. Oh, let's see. The composition of two elements to automorphisms is also an element uh, of the automorphism um, set. Yeah. The composition is associative. It is. Uh, the automorphism set contains the element uh, 1a, okay, which is the identity for composition. Mm -hmm. And that every element f has an inverse of uh, um, f minus 1, which is also an automorphism, right? And this uh, actually is an interesting thing. So um, this set of automorphisms with the law of composition, they together form a group, right? We don't, we haven't yet got to the groups. We're going to meet groups um, next week, yeah. And um, but um, all we need, all you need to know about groups as of now is that um, it's a set which uh, satisfies some conditions. A set with a law of composition would satisfy some conditions. Um, and those conditions are precisely these ones, right? So the composition of two elements is also an element of the set. The composition is associative. Mm, the composition uh, satisfies the identity. Every element has an inverse, right? Um, and uh, this makes it a group. And um, yeah, we're going to soon uh, meet groups next week. Okay, so now we have uh, let's see, monomorphisms and epimorphisms. Okay, so we we've seen this before in the last lecture, um, but um, yeah, let's see, let's see them again. 
uh, in terms of uh, categories. So um, if you have a category, then uh, morphism F from A to B is going to be a monomorphism if um, this holds. Right? What holds is that um, um, you have um, for all the objects Z of the category all the morphisms from um, this Z to A um, satisfy this. All right. So um, again, we've seen this. Move. This is again the same thing as we did in the set uh, when we were working with sets and functions. All right. So you have a morphism f going from A to B. Uh, you have these morphism alpha prime and alpha double prime which come from Z to A and if when you compose these two with F if they happen to be equal right which is this then that implies these morphisms are equivalent right and um, the epimorphism is the same thing except in the uh, other direction so instead of having F composition alpha prime you have beta prime composition F so it's the um, it's the other way around. Right? Yeah, we, we've seen this before that in the category of sets, uh, the monomorphisms are precisely the injective functions, right? Um, and uh, as you can see, um, the epimorphisms are the subjective functions right? because, you know, um, they uh, make sure that every element of um, of Z is mapped by something from B, right? And um, yeah, that's that satisfies subjectivity. Okay, I'll see. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Yeah, so, um, so they're talking about something like, um, how, uh, in set theory, um, uh, you have an isomorphism if and only if it's both injective and subjective. By definition, it's a bijective. Um, and thus it has to be both uh, monomorphism and epimorphism. Um, but um, this is... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but this actually doesn't hold for every category, right? We're going to see rings um, and uh, we're going to see rings after a long time actually. I think you'll have to wait around two more weeks. After two two more or yeah, two more weeks until we get to rings. Um and we'll see how that works there. Okay, so that was about um morphisms and their properties. Um I guess it it, it makes m much more sense, right? I mean it's it's just at a different level of ab abstraction, but it's pretty much the same in how we saw in sets. And yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have the last section for um, this chapter um, about a few uni universal properties. Uh, we'll see that, and then uh, we'll be done for today's lecture. Yeah. Any questions? Huh. Okay, uh, have a good day, Nick. We'll see you uh, next week. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so now let's see a few universal properties. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, as of now, I think, like, you've got a sense of, like, why we're, we're doing this category stuff. Because, uh, um, like, unlike set theory, because in set theory, you have to worry about each of the elements, right? At an elementary level, you have to worry about, like, uh, if each element, uh, should satisfy, uh, the conditions to be in the set. But, um, from the point of view of categories, we're looking at a very uh, higher point of view, from a very higher point of view, and um, you're considering the objects and the relations between these objects, right? So you're like building it, uh, you know, piecewise, and um, like uh, at, at some point, like if you actually form a category, then you can like uh, zoom out and look at the um, so-called universal properties which are like universal for the entire category so yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a few definitions to see. Let's see. So you have a category C. Then uh, we say that an object I of C is initial in uh, the category if for every object A of C there exists exactly one morphism going from I to A in the category. Right? So, um, right, so this object is initial because um for um every other object a there is exactly one morphism that goes from i to a right so the home set of i to a where a is any object uh, th this is just uh, a set with one element a singleton right um in yeah for the um final object uh, you have the same thing right so uh, the object is final if for every object uh, a there exists exactly one morphism from a to f so instead of from i to a um, you have a to f uh, so the home set uh, a to f is a singleton right? And that is uh, the category, uh, sorry, that is the final object in the category. And yeah, not every object should have, uh, like needs to have an initial or final object. Um, and let's see this clip, let's see this example. So the category obtained by endowing uh, Z with the relation of um, this uh, less than or equal to has no initial or final object um mm -hmm. yeah because uh, because to have an initial object you would need that i must be less than or equal to a so this has to hold for all the integers a and um there is no such integer And similarly, the, there is no final object because that would uh, need um, the object to be larger than every other integer, which is also not possible. Hmm. Okay. So we have another example uh, in the category of sets. Uh, the empty set, the null set, is uh, the initial. Um, the empty graph defines the unique function from the null set to any given object. Mm hmm. And clearly, it is the unique set that fits this requirement. And it's an exercise. Okay.
so yeah it, it makes sense right in the um uh in the category of sets it, the null set is like uh is like the set from which you can like um have exactly one uh, morphism to any other set right mhm mm Um, the category of set also has final objects. For every set A, there is a unique function from A to a singleton. That is the constant function, like, um, this also makes sense. Uh, the final objects are, um, the objects which give you, um, a singleton, um, from a set. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we claim that if initial or final objects exist, they're unique up to a unique isomorphism. So, this is important. So, um, uh, if you have, um, like, um, like, um, objects in a category, and if uh, these ob th there exists some initial and final objects in this category, then these initial and final objects are unique. Um, up to a unique isomorphism. So up to if, until you have an isomorphism, um, they are unique. And we have a proof for this, which is uh, kind of uh, let's see. So um, you have a category C, and I. You have two initial objects. Um, and two final objects. So your claim is, um, uh, these two initial objects are isomorphic and these two final objects are isomorphic. And furthermore, these isomorphisms are unique. Okay, okay so the proof goes something like this. Um, recall by definition of the category that every object A of C, there is at least one element in the set of endomorphisms, right? This is the identity. Um, now, if I is the initial object, then there is a unique isomorphism from I to I, right? Which has to be the identity, because um, 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 because um, the initial uh, object um, demands only one morphism from itself to any other object. Um, so, um, if you're having that, uh, to itself, then it has to be the identity. Okay, so now if you assume that I1 and I2 are both initial objects in C, um, since I1 is initial, oh, okay, it's, it's kind of, um, um, uh, straightforward. So, you, because I was in, I1 is initial, you can say that you can have a unique morphism from I1 to I2, that is F. But as I2 is also an initial object, you can have G, which goes from I2 to I1, right? So you have them, um, and you consider the composition. The composition happens to be the identity on the two uh, initial uh, things uh, that you assumed. Um, um, and then uh, the thing is, this... Uh, map, sorry, this uh, morphism between I1 and I2 actually happens to be the isomorphism, right? So this, uh, these um, initial objects are um, distinct up to isomorphism, right? But here we show that they are isomorphic, so they are the same, yeah. And for uh, the uh, um, final objects, um, you can follow the same logic. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have um the universal properties, then quotients, um and products and co products. 
Let me do propositions. Okay, so we have a few things to use. go to. Let's see. Mm hmm So yeah, we haven't yet got to um like a point of um much more abstraction. That's when we will deal with functors. So functors are uh like we, like until now we have been just forming relations between these objects in a category, but we haven't jumped from one category to another. Uh, you can jump from one category to another, and that's what a functor allows you to do. Um. Mm -hmm. But okay, let's see. We say that a uh, construction satisfies a uh, universal property when it may be viewed as a terminal object of a category. Okay, the category depends on the context and is usually explained in words. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so if you're considering the uh, category of sets, uh, you're going to say that the null set is universal with respect to the property of mapping to sets. Yep, so um yeah so this is like um a universal property for the category of sets and it's the same thing as saying um that the null set is the initial object in the category of sets mm hmm Oh, hello, Mika. Hello, hi everyone. Yeah, we're doing uh, abstract algebra today. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I'm sorry for my, like, my, like, random participations. <laughs> but uh, I hope that I'm not bothering you being here this way. No, it's, it's fine. Thank you. Yeah, so today we're doing category theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a few more things to go through. Uh, let's see, the quotients. Um, so you can have uh, an equivalence relation, tilde, uh, defined on a set. Now, um, if you have this following assertion that the quotient a uh, slash tilde is universal with respect to the property of mapping a to a set in such a way that the equivalent elements have the same image. Okay, so what this is saying is that if you have functions from a to any other set z, then um, your equivalence uh, relation is defined in this manner. A prime is equivalent to A double prime um, implies that their images are um, are equal, are the same. Right? So phi of A prime is equal to phi of A double prime, and that uh, shows that A prime and A double prime are um, equivalent. Mm -hmm. So these morphisms um, are actually objects of a category, and we denote uh, these objects by phi z. So phi is the function that you're uh, having uh, from A and the set z that you're going to. So the only reasonable way to define morphisms uh, between these objects 
um, is uh, by the commutative diagrams here, right? Um, and as we've seen before, um, and this looks a lot like the sliced categories we saw before, right? Um, so the claim um, here uh, is that denoting a pi, denoting by pi the canonical projection, which we've defined before, the pair uh, pi, comma and the quotient um, set is an initial object of this category. Mm -hmm. It it is yeah it's it isn't also like that hard if you see um you you consider one of the objects phi z right from a to z you have phi so you have to prove that there exists a unique morphism from um phi z sorry from uh pi and the quotient set to phi z so these are two different objects in the category. Uh, you have to show that there is an exactly unique morphism between these two, right? And that is equivalent to saying that there is a unique commutative diagram uh, representing uh, this. All right. So um, what you do is you take uh, uh, an arbitrary element of this quotient set, um, and you try to apply the commutativity of this um, uh, diagram. So phi bar of this um, element uh, is equal to phi of A um, because, um, you know, um, wait a second. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah, okay, so the thing is, yeah, if the diagram commutes, then it's going to be that phi bar of this element is going to give you phi of A, right, because um, um, that's what phi bar um, is defined like, right, um, mm -hmm, okay, so um, what this says is that uh, um, this says phi bar is actually unique, if it exists. Okay, so now what we have to show that this actually exists. This phi bar is well defined, and if we can show that, uh, we're done. So, um, to, to show that phi bar is well defined between uh, these two objects, you have to show that um, this um, if uh, two um, elements, a1 and a2, so here, remember, these are equivalence classes, right? Uh, from equivalence relations, um, their equivalence classes, and uh, if they are the same, then their images phi a1 and phi a2 are the same. Okay, um, okay and um, that works because um, if you have the equivalence classes of two elements as the same, then the elements themselves are equivalent under the relation. Then that implies um, phi of a1 is equal to phi of a2. Um, because of um, because of um, the wait yeah because a one and a two are equivalent under the um, um, under the relation so the images um, are going to be um, the same. Hmm. Okay, so we have um, something else. Uh, we have products. Um, let's see what products are. Um, so, okay, so now uh, what we do is you take, um, you try to see how these categories are going to work with quotation products. Right?
So um, here is the universal property. So if you have two sets A and B, and consider the product A cross B and its two natural projections, uh, which we've talked about, right? Uh, pi A and pi B um, going from A cross B to A. Um, then uh, for every set Z um, and these morphisms, right? Um, just like we had before for F1 and F2, so F1 and F and G, you, you have morphisms from Z that are FA going to A and FB going to B. Um, there exists a unique morphism that goes from Z to A cross B, from Z to the product. Right? So this is pretty interesting. So you have um, A cross B with its uh, natural projections. Uh, pi a pi b then uh, you have uh, z coming into the product with sigma um, and then you also have the uh, f a and f b from z right this diagram commutes and um, what you have now is like the sigma lets you have a relation between this z and a cross b so uh, the sigma can be written as f a cross f b now what you have to show is that uh, this whole thing actually commutes and uh, it's pretty um, easy to show uh, let's see um, so um, so you, you define this sigma for all z in z, um, sigma of z, what it does, it, it, it gives you f a of z and f b of z. Right? It gives you two components, f a and f b, um, and the component, the images of z uh, across these components. Um, so this diagram um, actually makes the whole thing commute. So if you see, if you take the composition pi a with uh, sigma of z, you're going to have pi a with f a of z and f b of z, and uh, as we know, the the projection just like takes one of the components, so you're going to have f a of z in the same way for f b, right? So this this lets us um like this lets us like do everything smoothly, and the whole thing um, commutes. Okay. Um, hmm. So that was about the products. Mm hmm. So yeah. So the main advantage of actually um, like having um products in this manner that you can uh, like do this with any category right um, like until now we have only seen products in sets but like um, you can have um, products and you can have more structure to them uh, we're going to see how you can have more structure and then uh, like you can make them different objects and then you can deal with them and um, that's uh, something of advantage if you're dealing with categories. Hmm. Okay, so now we have core products. Um, let's see. Okay, so yeah, this is the last section, uh, and then we'll be done. So um, the core products. Let's see, the prefix co. Uh, yeah, it normally indicates that you know it's um, like uh, reversing uh, the arrows. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so what we're going to have is um products are uh, final objects in the categories um C A B. Right? So if you go back to the products, um you have this as the fixed object and then you have two morphisms that go from the fixed object to uh, the two different objects. Um, in in the case of co-products it's the opposite. right? So you have two uh, um, uh -huh. okay so you have two objects whose target which have a common target. Right? And um, now these core products are going to be actually the initial objects uh, in the categories. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Um, A and B are objects of the category. Um, then the core product A. Um, this join union B. So the the symbol, this notation is actually for this join union. Um, and so this um, will be an object of C uh, endowed with two morphisms. So this has two morphisms, um, I A and I B, which go from um, A to this core product, B to this core product, and they all satisfy the following universal property. So the following universal property is that for all objects Z and uh, these morphisms, um, there exists a unique morphism going from the core product to Z such that this diagram commutes, just like before, except in the opposite direction, right? So this universal property is that um, you have you're going to have objects, right, uh, which are going to be uh, fixed, and then you're going to have morphisms. From A to A and B to this object, um, and then you have a unique morphism um, from this co-product to this object, and uh, everything smoothly um, follows and um, commutes. Right. Okay, so yeah, the proposition is that this disjoint union, uh, the disjoint union is actually a co-product in the category of sets. So here, uh, the symbol that we just saw, this thing, um, normally in set theory, in the category of sets, represents the disjoint union. But here, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means the co-product of two um, objects, right? But yeah, if we're talking about the um, disjoint union, then um, we have to prove that this actually is a co-product. Hmm. Let's see. So the disjoint union A um, cop B is defined as the union of two disjoint isomorphic copies. Uh, a prime, B prime of A and B, respectively, right? Yeah. So, for example, if you um, have A prime as uh, like zero with uh, the Cartesian product with A, and B prime as one with B, then you can have uh, these uh, functions I, A, and I, B that we needed, right? Um, for the uh, co-product. So I A takes you um, 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 from A to zero comma A because you know that's how you defined this, and B takes you from B to one comma B, right? And um, the, these are the elements um, of uh, this union, uh, the union of A prime and B prime, yeah. So now what you do, as we did here before, uh, you're going to take FA and FB 
uh, as uh, two morphisms to a common target, right? Z. Um, so they go from A to Z and B to Z. Um, and you define the sigma in this manner. So the sigma goes from the coproduct. The coproduct is just the union of A prime and B prime. Um, so sigma goes from this to Z. Okay? And how it's defined is precisely in this manner. So gamma, sorry, sigma of C uh, gives you F A of A if uh, C is 0 comma A, right? So if C lies in A prime, uh, it gives you F A of A. Otherwise, it gives you F B of B if C lies in B prime, right? And uh, this whole thing, like defining gamma of C is like, um, like lets you um, do everything that you want here, right? For the diagram to commute. Okay. And um, that was about uh, co-products. So yeah, you have a few exercises for the co-products. Um, yeah, you probably are not going to have any exercises in the p-set from here. Maybe you do actually. Yeah. But um, but yeah. Anything to ask? Um, any doubts or anything? Uh, yeah, Balto, you should go. Um, it's pretty late for him. Well, it's pretty late for me too, but yeah. Um, yeah, for those who are uh, still here, um, I would like to announce that uh, we're going to probably change our timing. Probably uh, make it a bit more earlier. Um, because for me, it's actually um, now, right now, 2 o'clock uh, late night. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to do this for the uh, rest of the course. So we're going to make it earlier, most likely um, an hour or two hours early. Uh, let me know if it's a problem for you. Um, we can find a common time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, then that's good. Yeah, and um I realized uh it's also a problem for some other members, so yeah. And also uh I don't think I um told this but um uh, those people who joined today and yesterday are going to get the OCW Scholar role. So this role, uh, like, um, kind of like puts you on the top list of members here, um, which means that you have or you are participating in a course on the server. So yeah, just uh, to let you know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to have the PISA discussion on next uh, Wednesday. Yeah, you have six days to work on the PISA. It's pretty easy, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, but also, l let me tell you, can you uh, access the PISA discussion channel? Those who are here, um, can you access it? I hope you can. Okay. So uh, here, uh, the, the goal for this channel is that uh, you can talk about the problems of the PSET here. You can ask any kind of doubts. You, you should not post any solutions, but you can ask any doubts. You can discuss them. And, um, you know, that's, that's for it. So, yeah, we, we can do that. And um, next week, we're going to meet groups. Yeah. And... Um where do we submit the solutions then? Oh, okay. So yeah, I I I I forgot to say that you you're going to um, DM me actually um um either handwritten or um, LaTeX solutions. Yeah.
Okay, okay, that's nice. Yeah. So, yeah, see you next week, and uh, we'll have our first lecture on groups. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, see you next week. Mm -hmm.